I am Pia Maria Torén, and this is the webinar called Enabling Business Agility Through Finance and HR. And uh, I'm going to talk about the needed change in business environments. Um, I want to start with a little bit about today's agenda. Um, talk a little bit about why do we need for change and then uh, a little bit about how we view other people, the human view of people, the problem with uh, traditional leadership, then we move into beyond budgeting, and then agile leadership for the future of work, and then how can we then evaluate people performance in new and different ways. And then just a little bit about how to get started. How do we really kick off this change? That is needed. I wanted to start with an introduction of myself. Uh, I am the inspiration director and founder of Agile People and Agile People is uh, essentially a network group, uh, a loosely coupled network, network group uh, where people come together to learn how to release potential through Agile leadership and HR. So my main target groups are um, HR and leaders. And lately, uh, I have also moved into working with finance because I understand that uh, to, to be able to change organizations, we also need finance on board. Um, I think you have a Q&A tool so that you will also be able to ask questions, but I will not bring them up until the end of the webinar then we will get some time and um, I will try to answer your questions. Um, the only way we can change organizations for the better is by limiting and removing the structures that we have built that are hindering people to be themselves and do what they can to perform in organizations. And these limiting structures are mainly found in finance and HR in companies. That's why uh, I have joined forces with uh, Bjarte Bugsnes, uh, and we are together uh, running trainings and workshops and webinars uh, where we talk about the necessary cooperation between the different parts of the company. We need cross-functional cooperation between finance and HR, since the most limiting structures are found there. And uh, Bjarte is on a plane from Brussels right now, so he could not join uh, this time, unfortunately. Maybe he can join next time. Uh, so you will have to, do, to uh, deal just with me today. So the way we see other people affects how we structure our management processes. And we can take a look at um, Douglas McGregor. He wrote a book in the end of the 1950s, beginning of the 1960s. It was called The Human Side of Enterprise. Uh, it was a great management book. And in that book, he talks about how we view other people. So we actually choose how we see people. And that also affects a lot how we structure our organizations, how we see other people. The X view of people means that uh, you think that people are lazy by nature, they are unmotivated, and they don't want to take responsibility. And if they can, they would rather game the system or, or you know, find ways to, to get around rules uh, and try to get the most of every situation. If you have the human view why, you instead believe that people want to be the best they can be and they want to create value for other people and they will also do so if they get the right conditions. And this is important. So you can go to yourself, you can think about yourself. Uh, how do I view other people? What is my uh, natural human view when I meet new people? And unfortunately, in organizations, often we 
structure for the worst possible employee we can imagine. And we call that employee Douglas. Uh, it, it's, um, Douglas was invented by Fabiola Eiholzer, who is an agile HR uh, colleague of mine in New York. And she's running Just Leading Solutions in New York. And she invented Douglas to be the, uh, the kind of cartoon for the worst possible employee we can imagine, who is always trying to game the system, who is always lazy, unmotivated, and doesn't take responsibility. And, uh, and it's for Douglas we create our structures. So we are essentially putting everybody in jail um, just because there are a few Douglases in our organizations. Instead, we need to take Douglas aside and, and handle that problem separately. And then we can li liberate the rest of the people. The problem with uh, traditional leadership and management, well, there are actually several different problems, but uh, this is a, a saying from uh, Russell L. Eikhoff, most corporate planning is like a ritual rain dance. It has no effect on the weather, but those who engage in it think it does. And much of the advice and instruction is directed at, at improving the dancing, not the weather. And um, um, this is what, the way we see business planning today. Uh, we cannot anymore predict uh, reality. We cannot predict what will happen. And change is exponential in the world. We talk about a VUCA world today. Uh, so it's a lot of uncertainty out there. And the future is very much unpredictable. Still, we try to, to make yearly business plans and we work with real yearly budgets, although we know that it will probably not happen that way. But we engage in this ritual because it makes us feel important. We will dig a bit deeper into this problem uh, that we see with management today and the way they try to control other people and the company. The definition of control is the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. And of course, we cannot direct people's behavior. We, we cannot uh, also direct the course of events because what will happen will happen regardless of what we want to happen. And in business terms, it's called controlling people and trying to control the future. And this is also the grand illusion here. People can and must be managed. That's what we think. And that the future is predictable and manageable. But really, uh, we know it's not. And we can work with Let's say we work with scenarios or scenario planning. We can have five different scenarios and the truth will probably be a mix of all these five scenarios that we work out. That way we can prepare a bit for what will happen. But uh, the belief that, that we can really know exactly uh, putting down the numbers in a budget and a business plan, it's, it's only uh, fooling ourselves. And most of the management uh, we do today is about making it difficult for people to do their job. So it's really more hindering than uh, liberating and empowering and uh, making people perform. So beyond budgeting is instead a new way of thinking of leadership uh, and management. It's a much better way of uh, dynamically making resources available and dynamically pl planning um, according to uh, what is actually happening in the world and how things are evolving. So the old way of leading and management um, is based on theory X, that people are lazy and must be uh, perf um, managed and motivated uh, 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 and that the world is stable. Now we are moving towards a dynamic environment. The business environment is becoming more dynamic and we need then to use the theory why way of 
of managing people. So in a Theory X stable world, we work with very rigid, detailed, and annual approach to management, micromanagement, if you want. The command and control is centralized, and we use carrots and sticks to, to make people move towards goals that we break down from, from top, top down. We also work with a lot of secrecy. We don't uh, use transparency as, as a way to, um, to make people take responsibility, but everything is very secret. Information is not shared, etc. because it, um, you think that you, you have more power if you stick to your information. Instead, we need in a theory why world, a more values-based leadership based on uh, autonomy where managers explain why and what, but leave the how to the teams and the people. And we need transparent information that people can use to make the right decisions wherever they are in the organization. And we try to find intrinsic internal motivation in people. In a dynamic environment, we, we cannot work with traditional detailed budgets. Instead, we, uh, we need to work with the relative and directional goals. So we are comparing uh, goals with others, maybe benchmarking, comparing with other people in the company. And uh, instead of saying uh, that we need to reach exactly this goal or this target, it's, it's more of an, a continuous improvement and a direction that we are moving in. And if everybody's moving in the same direction, we will get a lot of power from all the people. Uh, dynamic planning becomes a prerequisite here and forecasting and resource allocation together with that. And performance evaluation is done in a, with, with a more holistic perspective. It's not just results that counts. It, it's also behaviors and other things. So the beyond budgeting way of managing is a lot more adaptive and a lot more human. And uh, the, the management model for beyond budgeting consists of six leadership principles and six management processes. So leadership is based on uh, these values that you see on this picture purpose, values, transparency, uh, organization, avoiding hierarchical control and bureaucracy, autonomy, and creating customer value, which is also very much in line with agile leadership and agile ways of working. It's the same value system uh, that lies as, a, as the foundation for these leadership principles. Uh, about the management processes, there is a natural rhythm to many industries. It doesn't necessarily uh, evolve around the calendar year only. It could be other rhythms for different industries. And targets are set directional rather than fixed and cascaded top-down. Uh, planning and forecasting are lean processes, not rigid and political exercises. And the resource allocation are, um, are fostered through cost-conscious mindset. We make resources available as needed during the year. And uh, when you do a traditional budget uh, planning, the bank is actually only open uh, for two to three months a year. But in, in, in a future organization, the bank needs to be open all the time so that we don't miss any important opportunities. And we don't work with the detailed annual budget allocations. The performance evaluation is holistic and we use peers and collective intelligence a lot more. Um, and we don't link directly the performance evaluation to uh, the rewards and incentives uh, structure. Mm? There are three purposes with a budget. It's uh, what, is, uh, what it is we 
want to happen, it is what we think will happen, and then it's what do we think is needed for this to happen. So targets, forecasts, and resource allocation. We have baked this together into one uh, number. And to, to be able to work efficiently with this, we need to split and, and break, uh, break up that process. We, we need uh, separate tools to work with target setting. Uh, they should be inspiring and, and stretched and continuously improved. With the fo forecasting, uh, we need to work with very limited detail because we don't know what will happen. We can only guess. And uh, when it comes to resource allocation, uh, we make um, resources available as needed all the time, dynamically. We don't have any detailed allocations and it can change all the time. Even if I had in my budget a, a certain amount of people, maybe they are needed somewhere else during the year. And then you need to kind of shift uh, resources uh, and make them needed, um, make, make them available as needed in other departments. And all these three separate um, purposes with the budget, they are different numbers. Um, leadership then for the future of work. Well, we move from managing performance. Uh, this is when a manager, like on this picture, micromanaging manager who is say, describing exactly uh, what to do and how to do it. There may be other people who have better ideas uh, and we don't take that into consideration enough in this kind of situation. Instead, we're moving to enabling performance. Uh, so we can talk about the CEO uh, as the chief enabling officer. That's really the, the role of the CEO of today. It's not to be the chief executive officer, it's to enable for every uh, coworker or employee in the organization to be able to do their job in the best possible way by providing the right tools, uh, the right competence, by removing impediments, by making goals available and the vision and mission very clear, uh, providing the why and what, but leaving the how to the people, because then we also release intrinsic motivation in people. And leaders need to go first to be vulnerable and to make mistakes. Because if they do, other people will follow. And this is how we release innovation and creativity in people and intrinsic motivation. When people feel safe, uh, a lot of energy and innovation power will be released. So for leaders in general, it's time to get off that rocking horse where uh, we talk about administrative leadership and administrative leadership is when you have a checklist, a process, an IT system and um, everything else uh, to, to just fill it in and follow uh, the structure. Instead, we need to move to real leadership and real leadership is about making people go in the direction that we want people to go uh, because they want to go in that direction and it's called intrinsic motivation. The best uh, metaphor of all when it comes to uh, agile leadership is the gardener metaphor. So the company is a garden and there is an overall purpose for the garden. It could be to be as beautiful as possible or it could be to deliver fruits and vegetables for example. And regardless of the purpose, the garden needs to be taken care of to reach its purpose. We need to take care of the plants. Some like to grow in the shadow and some need more sunshine. And we need to remove the weeds around the little plant when it comes up. Some like to grow with other plants of diverse kinds to develop faster and become beautiful together. And some need a lot of space. 
Some need lots of water. Some grow slower than others, etc., etc. So the agile leader here in this uh, situation is the gardener who takes care of the plants, trying to fulfill the purpose of the garden. The gardener can create prerequisites for the plants to grow by giving the right conditions for every plant without forgetting about the whole garden. We cannot force this little seed to grow. We can try until we're blue. You still cannot do it. We can only give the right prerequisites and the right environment for that seed to grow. And then we can just hope that it will grow. And if it doesn't, we need to deal with that. It could be that the seed doesn't grow in our environment or that there is something wrong with the seed. Uh, or that the seed comes up as a weed in our garden, but may fit very good in another garden, since there may be other prerequisites there. So this is a beautiful metaphor, I think, for agile leadership, uh, the gardener. Uh, you can't really make people grow, but you can create the right prerequisites for them so that they can be happy and perform in your organization, seen as the garden. What about uh, performance management? Now we are entering HR, uh, lead, leaving finance and leadership uh, behind. What are the necessary changes here? Because this is to break up uh, the, the tight connection between budgets, performance management, and compensation. Uh, and how do we need them to, to change? Because when people have too strict fixed targets, they could destroy a lot of things. It will lead to a lot of bad behaviors in the organization if we work with fixed performance targets linked to, uh, for example, yearly bonuses. But what should we then do instead? What are our options? We want to set goals and we want to work in efficient ways. So if we look at why we do performance management, we find a lot of different reasons for doing performance management. We want to provide feedback and coaching to our employees. We want to increase performance through goal setting. We want to work with learning and development, and we want to base our compensation decisions on the performance evaluation that is usually done by a manager. Uh, so what we need to do here is to look at it the same way we look at budgets. We break uh, up the different purposes with the, uh, the, the different purposes with the performance management process into uh, what tools are we using to fulfill that purpose. And uh, for uh, the continuous coaching and feedback purpose, uh, we, we work with continuous coaching and feedback. We need to have a lot of uh, regular meetings and discuss uh, what are you doing, uh, to reach your goals in a more efficient way? What are the mistakes you made the last period? Uh, what is the best thing you did the last period? Uh, and we can ask, what can we do as managers to remove impediments, to be able to, to succeed, to reach targets and so on? Uh, we can also focus on team performance over individual performance because then we don't create these bad behaviors, we start to help each other to reach the team goals instead of competing with each other. OKRs is a great, great tool to increase performance in the organization. And this is an example of what you can do instead of working with traditional smart goals or uh, management by objectives and similar. OKRs is um, quarterly. They are set by each person in the organization, and you can also work with them on team level and on company level. The most important thing here with OKRs is that uh, they are used for increasing performance, they are used for learning, they increase collaboration, and they need to be transparent in the whole organization. Uh, what you cannot do with OKRs, though, is to link them directly to compensation uh, or compensation decisions. 
So this is a, a big mistake that will ruin uh, OKRs if you start to do that. Speaking of compensation, uh, performance management, there is also one purpose uh, for performance management to, to link it to compensation. And here we need to break the link between um, base pay and performance-based pay. So you have a, a base pay, it should be market-based or maybe a bit higher than market-based. Some, some companies use that as a competitive advantage to make the pay, base pay a bit higher than market pay. And the base pay should be based on the things that are important for the company. And then you could have a variable part of the pay that should not be mixed with the base pay. Why should it not be mixed? Well, because if we, if we mix uh, base pay with performance-based pay, we create golden cages for people. And even if they are not happy in the organization anymore, and they don't perform well anymore, uh, their salaries become too high to quit. So they, it's like putting people in jail when you, uh, when you mix up base pay with performance-based pay. Instead, keep performance-based pay uh, variable all the time. Don't uh, put it on top of the uh, salary. Um, to finish with, I would say a few words uh, about the change journey and how to get started with this. So uh, this is about a culture change. We're trying to change this system. It's mainly about changing the culture, changing behaviors, the way we view people, the way we treat people to be able to perform and be happy. So a first step would be to remove limiting structures which are the structures that I've been talking about, the budgets, uh, the fixed performance goals, the links to, to uh, bonuses and so on, uh, the structures that we find mainly in finance and HR. And then we try to increase instead supporting structure to make it very easy to be behave according to the agile mindset instead. And these supporting structures, it, it should be just enough to give support. And this is a balancing act. How much supporting structure depends on your organization, your situation, your people, and so on. Then we start to, to work on uh, trying to uh, increase new behaviors uh, that come from learning new ways of acting and working and providing a changed system to people because it's it's the structures that make people do different things. And then we re repeat again from one and start all over. These limiting structures, they have a tendency to come back again. So we need to keep a close eye on them. A prerequisite for change would be to have psychological safety in the organization. If we have psychological safety, we can unleash potential and create the conditions that are necessary for continuous learning and continuous improving. Um, and, and continuous improvement and learning is crucial for um, finding the right strategy moving forward and, and innovating and creating new products that customers want and need. Uh, so, when we don't feel psychologically safe, we tend to focus on internal group processes instead of focusing on productive work. And this is uh, something that Google has been researching a lot. Uh, which were the teams that were the most successful and produced the most output was the teams that were uh, most safe psychologically. So it's a huge factor in team success and in high performing teamwork that people feel safe to, to release energy, creativity, uh, and all the power that comes with that intrinsic motivation. 
Uh, Amy Edmondson uh, is a woman who coined this concept, psychological safety, and she did a lot of important research in the area of uh, motivation, accountability, and psychological safety, and the link between that. So if we have uh, high levels on both, we are in the learning zone. That's when we can release our potential. If we instead have low levels on psychological safety, but high levels on motivation and accountability, we feel very frustrated. You see the guy who, who has the mouth like a, a Z. <laughs> He's very frustrated because he doesn't feel safe, but he's very motivated. Um, if you instead are high on psychological safety and low on motivation, oh, you feel kind of happy, but lazy, you know, happy sleeper. You're not so motivated, but you feel quite safe. And the worst place to be, of course, is if you have low levels on, on both. So the culture, we talk about a lot about culture here. And what is it really? Well, um, if we look at culture, it's the sum of all the behaviors and habits that all the people in the organization show uh, over time uh, in an organization. And if culture consists of behaviors, what can we then change? How can we then change our behaviors? Well, there is a formula that Kurt Levine uh, invented in 1936. It goes like this. Behavior is a function of personality and environment. It means that behavior depends on one, personality, and two, the environment that this person is in. So if you put me with my personality, in a certain situation, in a certain environment, a company with uh, people, uh, one behavior will come out of me. If you put me in another situation, in another company, another environment with totally other people, another behavior will happen. So Kurt Levin, he was an, a German-American psychologist and he was known as one of the modern pioneers of social, organizational, and applied psychology in, in the United States. So, so then if we say that personality is fixed, we cannot really change our personalities. How then can we change uh, behaviors? Well, according to this formula, then we need to change the environment. We need to change the tools methods, models, and structures that we provide to people uh, every day to do their work. And this is then the recipe for changing culture. Um, I have found this model extremely uh, useful. It's built on uh, Wilbers, Ken Wilber's quadrants, uh, and it's, uh, I call it four organizational windows. It has four uh, fields where we have the individual internal field. This is basically personality, the intrinsic motives and basic desires, needs and values. And then we have the external part of people as well, of individual people. This is the visible part that you can see. You can see how people behave. You can see their skills. You, you can see traces of knowledge and competence. And then there is the, the other side, the organizational side, where we have the internal parts like norms, culture, organizational values. These are not visible often. Uh, we say culture is like an organization's shadow. You can't really you know, see it. And then we have the visible part, which, which are the structures, systems, processes, methods, and tools that are provided by management in an organization. And when we make a change, we need to think about this balance that, uh, that exists in this figure. What is it we are doing when we are doing an agile transformation? For example, let's say we are going to make an agile transformation. Uh, what we do is that we distort this balance in the picture. And uh, we provide some new structures, 
some new processes. Maybe we start using Kanban boards. Maybe we start working with Scrum. Maybe we start to work with some new tools. But very often we don't stop to use the old structures and systems and processes. We still do the old performance reviews, for example, together with the new ways of, of doing retrospectives in the end of the sprint. And it creates conflict uh, here. Also, it creates, uh, uh, since all the parts in this figure affect each other, it also creates uh, problems in the other parts of the figure. And we need to, to, to get back to balance here. So an organization have a tendency to bounce back uh, when we try to, to, uh, to change it. And if we don't change all of these four windows uh, at the same time, uh, then the organization will bounce back and, and become just like it was before, even though we try and try to change it. Uh, you can talk a lot more about this and, and the balances that we need to keep, but I think that's enough for now. So this is our new poster um, that has been released uh, yesterday uh, by me and uh, Mia Kolmodin and Bjarte Bogsnes. Uh, we have done this together as a teamwork uh, where we are looking at the most important parts when it comes to enabling business agility uh, with HR and finance. And uh, I urge you to download it, print it, put it on your wall, uh, read the details and please send me some questions if you have or Bjarte as well. We have um, a workshop uh, for HR finance and management and the next workshop will take place on April 11 in Stockholm and in that workshop uh, you will get a lot more practical examples. Uh, Bjarte has a lot of practical experience from Equinor I've been working with large Swedish organizations like Volvo Cars and IKEA and SQF and, and the other organizations. Um, and we will share our knowledge and our experiences on this workshop day. So to enroll, you can go to greenbullet.se slash enabling business agility. And I believe there will be an email sent to you after this webinar with the, the address as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you.